<laughs> Great. Hello, and welcome to this exciting podcast from ProSites. I'm Keith Washington, VP of Products at ProSites, and today I'm joined by Dr. Gary Bauman, who's going to share a little bit about his practice these past few months, and more importantly, tell us his experience with treating a patient or patients with asymptomatic COVID-19. A little introduction. Dr. Bauman is a graduate of the University of Maryland School of Dentistry, and he holds an MS degree in health administration. He served on the faculty of the University of Maryland Dental School for 25 years, and just recently retired from teaching as an associate professor. In addition, Dr. Bauman has participated in numerous scientific studies. He has been published in several journals and has lectured nationally and internationally. Dr. Bauman's specific interests include cosmetic restorations, and the treatment of patients with special needs. Dr. Bauman is a fellow in the American College of Dentists and the International College of Dentists, as well as an associate fellow in the American Academy of Implant Dentistry and a fellow in the International Congress of Oral Implantologists. Dr. Bauman is also a ProSites website customer, and he's the owner of the Baltimore Center of Advanced Dentistry Dental Practice. And I'm so happy he's joined me to talk about his practice and a little bit of his experience over the past year. Dr. Bauman, thanks so much for joining me. Pleasure to join you, Keith. It's great to have you here. And we talked a few weeks ago and I was fascinated by your story in general and your background. So tell us a little bit about how you got into dentistry and how it ties into your interest in general medicine. So, um... Came from a family uh, pretty involved in healthcare. Father was in pharmacy. Um, uncle was a physician. Mother was a medical technologist. But um, that's going way back. I'd rather talk about the the, the more uh, the more recent uh, past. But uh, my interest over the last oh twenty some odd years and then the last twenty years or so of teaching was um, in the medicine medical side of of, uh, of dentistry. I taught in the special care program at the University of Maryland. And uh, we, tra- we treated patients who were outside the mainstream. All dent- dentists know that when you're a student, you can uh, treat pretty much mainstream patients, but anyone outside is a little difficult. And what mm-hmm. that entailed a lot was seeing patients um, with medical issues um, and uh, things like uh, transplant patients, et cetera, that we, that we needed to treat. And so that, that was my interest over the last 20 years or so. Um, and I am fervently... Uh, I fervently believe that dentists need to start acting more like oral physicians um, uh, rather than we're just, you know, uh, carpenters of the mouth. And uh, I think the last year has uh, has proven that that is the case. And uh, whether we want to or not, we're going to be dragged into it, um, uh, kicking and screaming in some cases. What's your what is your what do you mean by oral um, physicians and, and how did uh, give me some examples of how you think that that needs to be transformed. So I, I always find it amazing that you know we're talking about um, healthcare reform over the last 30 years and then Obamacare. You can have an infection on your big toe, which is anywhere from five to six and a half feet, seven feet from most people's brain, um, and that's covered by uh, health insurance. Uh, you can have an abscess in your mouth, which is an inch away from your brain, and we've all known some, uh, we've all heard of some very unfortunate cases, and yet patients can't get treated for that. Um, and we don't think of it in that term, but um, you know what we do and the proximity of the, where we do it into other uh, vital organs in the body uh, means that we have to be thinking a little bit more on a global level rather than just teeth. And have you been working in that area, uh, specifically maybe in Maryland or in Baltimore, to try to get the word out in, in terms of dentistry becoming more of a mainstream medical, uh, tre- treated as a mainstream medical practice? So, again, what I taught was um, was different parts, review of systems of the body, let's say. Um, so if you had a patient come in in that day who was a, a kidney transplant patient, we would talk about kidneys. And it's amazing um, how you know some students and even some dentists. When I talk about this, don't even know the basics. You know, how do we how do we evaluate how uh, from a blood test how a person's kidneys are functioning, et cetera? So um, some of those things are really simple. You know, when when you and I were in dental school, we'd get a get a uh, some blood work back. It didn't have 
what was out of range. We actually had to know the ranges or we had to go look it up. Uh, now everything is listed as uh, as you're outside the range, so it's a little bit easier. But those are some things that we should know as healthcare providers. That's really powerful. Um, so if you think about this, you know, I, I guess you're kind of thinking that it may have accelerated in thinking in terms of medicine as re, as it relates to COVID-19, and it's been a rough almost 12 months now. Um, for sure. Tell us about your practice and how you've had to adjust over the past year. A little bit about your journey in your practice with COVID-19. Sure. Um, so we heard this was coming and uh, we tried to push off doing, um, you know, closing down um, as long as we could. But I remember we had a, a sedation case, about a five hour sedation case. And for five hours, as I was treating this patient, all I was thinking about was, Oh my God, what happens if one of my staff gets sick or if one of the patients mm. brings it in? And uh, we finished the case at about one o'clock and I announced to my staff that we were going to close down. Um, and that was on uh, March 16th, uh, two days before uh, the governor and the secretary of health in Maryland uh, forced us to close down. Um, and I was actually very comfortable with that decision because uh, the stress of worrying about patients and staff had just gotten too great. Um, but what we instituted very early on with my staff was, um, it's not like I said to them, okay, we're going home. Uh, we started talking about on a pretty much almost daily basis. We had probably two or three um, webinars every week uh, where everyone came on and we talked about what was going on, what was the latest research, what were the latest findings, um, where did we think this was going? Um, and what we were going to have to do to get back. And uh, we were out for eight weeks, uh, but we constantly spoke about, you know, what we what we thought we'd have to do. We did come in for emergencies. We saw emergencies, not only our, our emergencies, but emergencies of other doctors who did not feel comfortable going in, uh, coming into the office. Um, I think back compared to what we do now with PPE and everything, compared to what we did back in March, April, beginning of May, uh, it, it's amazing. Uh, we're so much more protected now than we were. We didn't have N95s and things like that. Uh, and then uh, I kind of read the tea leaves and a, a week before we were actually allowed to come back, I called my staff and I said, it's time to let's get back to work. And we spent an entire week. The first two days were basically just talking amongst ourselves. What are we going to have to do to keep everyone safe? Um, and then the next three days was actually implementing it in our office. As an example, we're fortunate that um, we're in like a circular office. Um, so we started deciding that patients are going to come in one way and go out another way. So there's no cross-contamination of patients. And we're still doing that to, the, to this day, um, hopefully with the vaccinations and everything that'll change a little bit. But um, we had a worry before anyone else even told us about plexiglass guards for our front desk people. Um, and uh, actually at that point, we got them in two days. I know colleagues of mine, it took them three weeks to get those guards uh, once they were in, in demand. So um, we saw the tea leaves, we spoke about it. I had staff members doing research on various parts of it. I don't take credit for this myself. I have a wonderful staff um, and everyone did their little part uh, to find out the information that we needed, come up with ideas. Um, I was re very reticent to say no to any of those ideas and most of them were good. Um, we, we, we bought uh, walkie-talkies as an example, so that people would not have to be going into different rooms. My office manager would not have to be coming back to talk to me. She could just use a walkie-talkie um, and talk to me. Uh, I had one in my office, had in the ops, had in the front desk. Um, we didn't use those very much, and I just gave them to my uh, four and a half year old granddaughter to play with. So, um, but we really, we really did everything. We, we, uh, we're involved with Crown Council ordering foggers um, at the very, very beginning, before anyone knew what that was. Um, we, I, I went and I got on Amazon, I got uh, air filtration, uh, HEPA air filtration with UV, uh, so that, it, thinking that we were going to use this. And uh, we spent a lot, a lot of time on that. And when we came back, of course, there was a lot of uh, nervous tension going on in the staff. Uh, some more than others, but everyone was pretty much nervous what was gonna happen. Having said that, most of my staff had gone through the 90s with HIV um, mm. and um, understood that 
we were already at a fairly high level. Dentistry was at a fairly high level uh, in terms of preparing for infectious diseases, yet this was novel. That's why they call it that. And no one was really sure how it was going to go. So I asked, uh, when we talked before, I asked what turned out to be a silly question about uh, your staff being concerned and not wanting to come back into the office. And you said something about your team that I thought was really instructive, not only to me, but maybe general, just practices in general. Um, and they probably are seeing the same thing. Tell us a little bit about your team. Um, so I, I am a solo practitioner uh, now. And uh, we have uh, two hygienists, two, uh, two assistants. We have an office manager. And um, some of them have been in dentistry for 30, 35 years. Um, others, like my office manager, came from the medical camp um, two years ago. Uh, so we're, we're diverse, uh, which is great because we get, um, we get ideas from, er from everyone's life experiences. Um, but they're a wonderful staff. Um, they, they knew that our primary goal was to take care of our patients. Mm -hmm. And we did that while we were closed, when patients called with emergencies or other doctors called with patients who needed emergencies. That is our overriding concern. We treat our patients like gold, and that permeates our practice. Um, and they're, they're the ones who, who actually got everything implemented. It's nice for me to sit on the sidelines and kind of oversee it. But they were the ones that made sure that absolutely everything from A to Z that we could possibly do to keep ourselves, the staff, and um, and the patients uh, healthy, that everything was done. That's absolutely wonderful to to hear, and I'm sure that that's repeated at dental practices across the U.S. and the world. Now you've been treating patients, um, and and the practice has been operating as close to normal as you can, and. Just maybe a few months ago, or maybe even two months ago, you saw sibling patients in your office, and you found something about these patients with regard to COVID-19 that you think would be helpful for other dentists to know about. Tell us what happened. So let me just go back, we'll take you back one more step. Once we sure. came back, it didn't end there. Of course, the science on COVID is, is uh, evolving, sometimes evolving rapidly. Pretty much every day at our morning huddle, we would discuss what's the latest science. We're doing that till today. We spoke about it today that the CDC just came out and said if you've been vaccinated uh, within uh, 90 days and you have a contact with a positive COVID patient, you do not need to, uh, to quarantine. It's brand new. Um, and why do they only have 90 days? Why are they only listening? Because we only have 60 days since the vaccines have come out and uh, 60 days of, of research. I'm sure that's going to be extended. So every single day that we were back, starting on May 11th, uh, we, we spoke about what the evolving science is, what the research is showing, and we really want it to be very science-based. There's so much out there in the media, and you'll hear from patients. I had a patient this morning uh, tell me that uh, she's in, her, in the 70s, she's not going to get vaccinated, and she's in healthcare, but she's not going to get vaccinated because it was just brought out too quickly. Um, well, the technology that's being used for the vaccines right now um, has been around for 10 years. Um, and uh, right now, with the tens of millions of people that have been vaccinated, if there was really something going on, we probably would know it already. But um, so every single day we, we spoke about um, and every single day the stress level went down just a little bit, not much, but just a little bit. Um, we were in full PPE. No staff member walked into a room with a patient without full PPE. And that included head covering, face shield, eye, eye protection, N95 or KN95 masks with double masking, um, gowns. Uh, so in December, the end of December, third week of December or so, um, I had two teenagers, siblings come in, a 17-year-old and a 15-year-old, both female. Uh, and uh, one of my hygien hygienists came back to me and said, you know, the 17 year old that I'm seeing has normally exquisite oral hygiene. And we love that word. We don't hear it enough with our patients. And uh, she said, and today she's got a lot of bleeding going on. I'm seeing some lesions in her mouth. And as I'm walking down the hallway, I'm thinking 17 year old, probably something hormonal. We see that a lot. Uh, and I sit down and I look in her mouth and she has, she, her, her gingiva is extremely inflamed. And she has uh, multiple lesions all over in all different areas of her mouth, lip, free gingiva, uh, tongue. And I 
out of the corner of my ear, as I'm examining her, I hear the other hygienist say to the 15-year-old sibling, I'm going to show you how to floss again, because normally your gums are really good, but today there's a lot of bleeding going on. And my antenna just went straight up like this. Mm. I'd already kind of decided that what I was seeing in the 17-year-old was viral. The lesions looked viral. Uh, but once hearing two siblings, and I'm not sure I would have, I would have thought of anything of it if, uh, if both of them weren't in at the same time. I went over to see the 17 year, the 15 year old. Uh, 17 year old mentioned to me that she always gets cold sores, so she wasn't surprised. She knew she had a little something, but she also she clearly didn't know the size or the 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 uh, number that she had in her mouth. I went over to the 15 year old, and her gingiva was fire red with lesions on it. And I lifted up her tongue and on the ventral surface of her tongue, uh, saw these massive leukoplakic lesions, uh, which she was unaware of. Hmm. And at that point I said, hmm, that's exactly what I said. I said, something's going on here. And go, let's go back one more step. Um, I thought it was very important and I think it's very important going back to that oral physician um, every, every dental student, every dentist hates oral medicine. We see a lesion, we send it over to the oral surgeon. But with all this going on, I had decided back in, in September, October, we need to start doing testing for COVID in our office. I myself tried to get tested. I had to go online. I had to find an appointment at a pharmacy. I had to drive to the pharmacy, wait online there. Um, they actually made me do the test myself. Um, and I said, you know what? We can do this. This is, this is not a difficult test to do. Uh, it took me about six weeks to get set up with LabCorp, which is one, one of the largest uh, labs in the country, but uh, they allowed us to do it. And I believe at the end of October, we started doing testing for our patients and sundry others. And it was so easy for our patients. Either they were coming in anyway, or they know us very well. They've been patients for a long time and they would call us. Now, if they were symptomatic, um, we did not let them into our office. We met them down in full PPE, one of, either myself or one of our staff members, at their car in the parking lot, did the, did, the, uh, did the swab for them. And in most cases, we were getting the test results back in about 36 to 48 hours. Uh, some, around some of the holidays, it took a little bit longer. Reason for patients coming in, they had a contact with someone that tested positive or they thought they had symptoms of, uh, of COVID and wanted to be tested. Or some of them, especially around the holidays, were going to see their grandchildren. And their children said, if you're coming, you better have a negative test. So those patients would come into our office and others just were in the office and said, you know, I, I haven't been tested yet. Can you test me? It was very easy for the patients. It takes, took us 15 seconds. Um, it really didn't take a long time. My office manager was able to fill out the paperwork. Um, so we felt we were doing this as a, as a service to our patients. And I will tell you that the goodwill engendered by doing this for them um, has been incredible. And they have sent us um, other people who were not patients of ours asking, would you, would you do a test on them? We did it. And some of these patients have been, and some of these people have been converted to patients. So okay. the goodwill of making it easy for them um, has been incredible. Um, and people are going to remember that for a long time. Uh, some of the comments we have from people who aren't our patients is, why isn't my dentist doing this? So, um, but, and, and dentists can do this for, for uh, multiple reasons. You can do it as a community service. You can do it as a service to your patients. You can also make it a, a, a revenue center if you'd like. We decided personally we weren't going to get involved in that. But um, doing the test, you can uh, submit this, this to patients' uh, medical insurance and get reimbursed for it. Uh, we decided we weren't going to get involved in that. But so we had been doing that since October. So I think the fact that all of my staff were trained and were able to do the COVID testing, um, as I said, it's not a, not a difficult test, but the fact that we were all doing it gave us a little bit of a thought process. Hey, maybe these two kids, maybe something's going on there with COVID. At that point, I called mom since they're both minors. And I said, I'd, I'd like to do the PCR testing on them for COVID. And mom said, sure, no problem. We did the test on them, took lots of nice photos and uh, send them on their way. When they got home, uh, mom, who was very concerned, uh, called me and said, would you mind if I take them for rapid testing? And she had an outlet to do that. Um, and I said, sure, not a problem. Um, the 15-year-old tested positive on rapid testing. Um, the 17-year-old tested negative. Mom, while she was uh, at the test site, said, I'm here. Might as well test as well. Mom tested positive. 
Uh, dad mm -hmm. went uh, an hour or two later to get tested as well. He tested positive, ad, as did an 11-year-old sibling. Um, as well, uh, they had been with their daughter, son-in-law, and six-month-old baby the weekend before. Um, all three of them tested positive. The 17-year-old actually seroconverted um, on PCR, and the PCR bore that bore out the same testing. The 15-year-old was positive, 17-year-old was negative, um, but the 17-year-old uh, converted seropositive approximately four or five days later. Wow. So we had eight people of two households um, who would have been walking around passing this along, and if you want to know why this spreads and why we have these hundreds of thousands, if not millions of cases, that's the reason. Um, that you would have had eight people who were out in the community. Uh, one, the mother taught in a school um, that was, was having uh, current classes in person. So we would have had eight people spreading it probably to hundreds of people. And, and you, um, one of the reasons we're talking is because we'd like to get the word out is, is, a, is a, you know, another indicator for dentists to be looking out for this type of potential asymptomatic, um, you know, thing that you're seeing and in, in, that you saw in these patients. But you've also talked to a couple of dentist friends that have run into the same thing and that you that, that, that may have found out the same the same information. Correct. Um, interestingly enough, um, we decided to push when we weren't we were one A in Maryland to get the vaccine but none of the counties in Maryland had any plan for dentists. And we decided right. to push a little bit. We started an online petition. Uh, we got onto all three of the major network uh, news, local news stations here in Maryland. And I happened to mention when I was asked, well, why should dentists get the vaccine so early? Besides the fact that we're in your face, we're the only medical professionals that really cannot have patients wearing masks when we're seeing them. Um, I happened to mention that we had just diagnosed this a couple of days later, we had just diagnosed some cases of COVID in our office, asymptomatic patients, simply through uh, oral lesions. And I started getting phone calls. I got phone calls from uh, doctors that I didn't know. I got phone calls from doctors that I did know saying, I have a patient in the chair, I'm seeing some things, what should I do? Um, I had one colleague of mine that I was talking to who, uh, when I told him the story, he said, wow, that's wild, last week, I got a call from a colleague of mine, he's a periodontist, got a call from a colleague of mine that he has a patient in the chair. We had a patient in the chair who had these lesions. He wanted to know if he sent him pictures, if he could, um, if he could help him with the diagnosis. And um, it took about two days for him to get back to each other. And by that time, the other dentist had said, oh, don't worry about it. The patient came down with COVID, so I can't see him anyway. Wow. So chances are, that the lesions he was see he was seeing were related to COVID. He was thinking some something else. Never got the patient back because he ended up having COVID, which is fascinating to me. That it's totally, um, fa totally fascinating. And and what a great service you've been doing in 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 the community as well as um you know it's it's likely other dentists may have seen this or may not have seen it and not known what to do about it. So that's that's just fantastic. So I've been very passionate over the last uh, almost two months now of getting the word out first locally and then hopefully a little bit further afield um, with some press, with some, we, we actually um, are just writing a, writing up a case report. We've written up a case report for it. Uh, just to let doctors know, dentists know, uh, it's not the cases that you know about that you have your patient calls up and says, you know, I have a sore throat, I'm, I lost my sense of smell. Those aren't the ones we have to worry about. We really have to worry about in our office uh, about the uh, the asymptomatic cases that are going to come in. Now, you, you asked me about my staff. Just to just to explain how great my staff is, um, when we diagnose these cases, and I've heard in other practices, you know, patients called four days after they'd been in the office, and yes. all, you know, they test positive, and oh no, what do we have to do? We got to close down the office. I got to stay home in this. Our staff had been we had been trained. We trained ourselves. We educated ourselves. And the whole idea of being in full PPE when these patients were in the chair is that we didn't have to quarantine. That's the whole idea of doing everything that we did. There was no one who was in contact with these patients that wasn't in full PPE or behind plexiglass or whatever it might be. So at that point, even the, the most skittish staff members that I had back in May were calm, cool, collected, understood what we had done, how, how wonderful it was that we had that they had diagnosed these cases 
and there was no panic. Um, everyone really did their job perfectly to the point where we did not have to close down. No one had to stay home. No one had to quarantine. We said everyone still needs to be very careful and watch the symptoms, of, of course, um, but that's the way it went. So doctors need to know you, what you're doing and what you've been asked to do with PPE and everything else and wiping things down and fogging and air filtration. There's a reason for it that you are seeing patients that have COVID in your office. There is no question whether you've diagnosed them or not, whether they had oral lesions or not. And the things that we've been asked to do are the things that are keeping us helping our patients and not spreading this any further and not endangering ourselves or our staff. Great, great point. I, that's that's a fantastic point, and I think it's under discussed. Um, you you mentioned that you are uh, you've been doing testing, COVID testing, and I, when we talked, you were considering, and many other dentists are considering administering COVID nineteen vaccinations at your practice or their practice. Um, can you tell us about the process, where you are with that, and why do you think you want to do that for patients? Sure. Well, so again, with my background, I've been railing for years how, and nothing against our pharmacy friends, but I think we have a little bit more experience uh, injecting uh, patients. And pharmacy pharmacists and their staffs take a few hours course, and all of a sudden they're injecting patients for be it the flu vaccine, shingles, pneumonia, whatever it is. Well, I, I think those of us who are in practice who have um, thousands and tens of thousands of injections um, in, under our belt would be the best healthcare providers to provide vaccinations. And um, most states have not allowed it up until now. Um, I know there are some states, especially out west, where dentists now have been allowed to give the COVID vaccine. In Maryland, we are trying to get that changed. There is a bill uh, before the legislature right now to allow dentists to uh, provide vaccines. The governor has put out an executive order stating that all healthcare providers with appropriate training um, are allowed to uh, give COVID vaccines. Um, yet, uh, when we contacted our county department of health, uh, we were told that uh, we're not expecting to use dentists at this time. Um, uh -huh. So we're having some discussions about that. Um, I'm looking maybe at another, uh, at another petition because that that seemed to work well it's too. Indoor, yes yes well <laughs> once we put that petition up within 48 hours all dentists in uh in in maryland were invited to uh, sign up for vaccines 48 hours so um you know putting it out in the public there um i can't tell you how many dentists have reached out to me but also how many patients saw us on tv and said that's insane that dentists weren't get weren't on the list for, for vaccines. And I think most people, most uh, right thinking people would say the same thing. It's pretty crazy that dentists, more people come to the dentist on a regular basis than see their physician on a regular basis. So okay. what would be better, not even COVID related, but what would be better than, you know, patients who are on a six month recall, they come in in the fall, you know what, get your teeth taken care of and get your, your flu vaccine at the same time. Imagine how that would increase the, the utilization of the flu vaccine. Um, so that's that's kind of kind of going to be the next battlefront. I'm hoping that the legislature takes care of it, and then then it's just a matter of convincing dentists that this is a good thing uh, for you to do. Again, just being more part of the overall medical and healthcare community. Yeah, I was. We talked about it a little bit. Um, where and you even brought it up. Where there's a revenue component, but and there's a community component for sure. But also there's a you know, it, it takes time. It's a little bit different than doing COVID testing. It takes time and, and the revenue may not be there. You got to change out PPE. Well, how do you balance all of that? So, you know, uh, dentists are known for their charitable works, their, their, their sure. good deeds, uh, their pro bono work, uh, missions abroad and locally. We are an incredible profession and it doesn't get talked about enough. Uh, and I think this is one of the opportunities that we have. Sure, is it difficult? Yes, we got to change out PPE. Um, does it take a little bit of our time? Absolutely. That doesn't mean you want to make it a revenue center. You want to charge for you know for a COVID vaccine. But, you know, if we're going to have to be giving these every year or every two years, you want to make that into a revenue center. That I'm fine with that. But I, I, I got to tell you, as a community service, as a, a service to your patients. Um, there is nothing like it. We, we're just getting, it's the nicest thing is that here we come into patients, we're looking like spacemen, 
and patients are joking with us. They can't see us. They don't really know if we're there, but they are so appreciative and so gracious mm. about what we've done to keep them safe, to keep them treated, to keep them out of pain, um, and now to help them with this part of their lives to get tested easily. Um, and you know, one thing we haven't spoken about is is the pathology that we're seeing because of COVID. Uh, and I'm, I, 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 I've, I've spoken to so many dentists, and it, it's kind of like we need to aggregate this because I was speaking to a dentist probably in December, and I mentioned that week I had had four patients who have been in our practice from eight to 18 years and almost never had any carious lesions, no cavities, no nothing. And on these four patients, I diagnosed multiple carious lesions on each of them. And we're talking, he said, that's funny. This week I had four patients that we diagnosed um, candidiasis on. Mm. Well, what's the, common, what's the common thread there? Patients are wearing masks so much of the time, especially if they're out and about. If they're in their homes, they're probably not. But even if they have people coming in in their home, people are wearing masks. We're not getting the air exchange that we, get, that we got previously. Patients are reporting xerostomia, dry mouth, incredibly. So many patients are reporting. That's the common denominator. People wearing masks, they're getting carious lesions. Most of these carious lesions were at the gingival margin. Um, and then uh, two weeks ago, uh, one day after the other, I diagnosed two patients with candidiasis. They've sub subsequently been in after, after treating them with, with, um, with medication. They're clear now. So that's the other component of this. You know, that it, it, we're, seeing, we're seeing fractured teeth. We're seeing necrotic teeth. We're seeing TMJ issues all of those related because of stress about what's going on, you know, everything that's going on. So all of this taken together, our patients are relying on us um, to diagnose those dental issues, um, but also to realize that there's a connection here with COVID, with the stress from COVID, with wearing masks, et cetera. I and, never heard that. That's really interesting, Dr. Bauman. I thought you were going to say that you're seeing more um, oral disease because people aren't going to the dentist as much. They're not coming to see you. And now it's, you know, for some people, it may have been a year, could have been a year and a half by now. But you're saying that there's also impact even for your patients who may be on, you know, a regular appointment schedule. I have seen more patients with necrotic teeth. Um, in the last six months than I've probably seen in the five years previous. And now when patients are coming in and saying, you know, this tooth's bothering me, usually we'd say a cracked tooth, you know, and then, yes. and then it doesn't get better. And we go in and we find out that the nerve is necrotic. So um, there is so much more to this. Um, and that's why we have to think more, a little bit more globally than maybe what we were doing beforehand. And our patients are relying on us to do this. Um, and uh, again, the goodwill that this is engendering, patients are so grateful, A, that we're yep. open, that we're treating them, um, that we're able to treat them and, and find these things and really say to them, it's not your fault. You know, everyone's, oh, what did I do? You know, it's not your fault. Everyone's stressed out from COVID, you know, the masks, um, you know, oral hygiene may not be as great. I, I've had some patients tell me they haven't left the house in three months, mm. yet they're not brushing their teeth. And I say, why not? I'm just too depressed to brush my teeth. Mm. And we all know we get into these funks, whatever. So we have to we have to understand that we have to be aware of that. And our motto in our practice is for pretty much everything, um, find a way to say yes. You know, we had one patient who only wanted to be in the first patient of the day because she didn't want to have any yes. contact. Try to find a way to say yes. Your your patients will be grateful for everything to you. I really appreciate you saying all of that, um, and, and you've kind of talked about it a little bit. It's just, you know, last question I had. I have this hope that you know, with the vaccine and and our cases going down, that we're starting to at least see the light at the end of the tunnel. What are your thoughts about the next few months, six months for your practice, and what should dentists look forward to? So it's very interesting. We, from the time we opened up back in the middle of May through probably December. Um, everything was gangbusters. I mean, really, we were busy like anything. Um, I think a lot of it is patients had, had discretionary income um, for those who kept their job, which is probably 80% of the population. Um, they, um, they're not spending it on going on vacations. And, and a lot of patients were coming back and saying, okay, you know, I've been waiting to do this treatment. Let's do it now. Um, we've seen a little bit of a, of, a, of a downturn over the months of January and February, and I'm hearing that from a lot of dentists. 
Um, we're getting, my hygienist was just telling me they've called a lot of patients to come in. People are starting to say, I'm going to wait until I get both, both doses of the vaccine. Right. And so we're seeing this downturn, but I think in a very short order, probably within the next month, A, the, uh, the supply of vaccinations is just going to skyrocket. We're seeing that already with the numbers. I think probably within a month, anyone who wants a vaccine pretty much will be able to get it. Um, and the key is that we are positioning ourselves that when that happens and this influx of patients comes back, um, that we are ready for them. And uh, so I, I would say maybe the next month to month and a half might be a, still a little bit rocky uh, for a lot of practices. Um, but I, I think we're going to start calling this time the Roaring Twenties again. Um, and I think we all should be ready for it. Uh, if you haven't taken the CE to do, you know, the cosmetics that you want to do, start taking them now. Good point. Um, if, if, you're, if you're interested in doing oral sedation, because a lot of patients need it, and we've been doing this for 20 years, just do something about it now so that you are ready that when things really start taking off, and, and by us and also in the economy, that you're ready to do that and uh, conserve your patients. Great. Dr. Bauman, thank you so much for taking the time to talk today. What you've said is probably one of the most important things I know at ProSites we've talked about. Um, and uh, you're just a great example of all the work that our dental community does and continues to do to support our patients through this pandemic. I really appreciate just having the chance to talk to you and getting the word out about you know some of your findings. Our team at ProSites is grateful to you and the service that you provide to our customers and your, and, and your patients. And we as, as well look forward to helping you and your practice and all of the dental practices as you try to do everything you can to acquire and retain patients now and into the future. I really appreciate you taking the time. Really Wonderful. look forward to hearing more um, and, and talking to you in the future. Pleasure to be with you today. Thank you so much. Have a great day.